In this video, we'll be breaking down and analyzing SpaceX's Starship Integrated Flight Test 3. We'll quickly review what's changed since the last flight, then examine key moments such as the launch, hot staging, booster landing, in-space demonstrations and re-entry. Then we'll discuss the positive and negative takeaways and finally finish off by considering what's next for Starship. If you haven't seen the previous video analyzing Starship IFT2, I recommend watching it first because this video assumes that you're familiar with everything that was discussed there. With that said, let's get into it. First, a quick summary of the most significant of the thousands of changes between this flight and the last. The propellant load time has been reduced from about an hour and 34 minutes previously down to just 50 minutes. This is thanks to additional pumps and subcoolers installed at the orbital tank farm. An important change to address the booster's rod in the previous flight is an upgrade to the liquid oxygen filtration. It also looks like the baffles inside the LOX tank have been upgraded, based on these new weld marks which appeared on booster 10. This should help with the huge amount of slosh during hot staging and boost back. Ship 28 is the first Starship to fly with the newer electric thrust vector control system, rather than the old hydraulic system. This change saves weight, reduces complexity and improves reliability. Measures have also been taken to increase the ship's protection from engine bay fires and to reduce the risk of leaks which can fuel them. Engine bay fires have been a constant issue for Starship so I hope this is the last time I have to mention this. A change which we all loved was going from a single Starlink terminal on Ship 25 to four on the nose of Ship 28. They're spaced this way so that a pair of dishes will have a view of the sky even when the ship is on its side. This is what gave us those gorgeous HD onboard views. Booster 10 also has a pair of Starlink terminals mounted on top of two of the chines. Ship 28 is also the first Starship to fly with a functional payload door. Ship 25 did actually fly with an earlier design of the door, but it was welded shut. This brings us to the next change. Starship S28 is the first ship that planned to do anything useful during its coast before it re-entered. The plan was for the ship to test the payload PEZ door, demonstrate a transfer of propellant from a header tank to a main tank and, optionally, relight a Raptor engine to simulate performing a deorbit burn. Finally, a major difference from the previous two flights is the trajectory. Instead of splashing down in the Pacific near Hawaii, Ship 28 would re-enter and splash down in the Indian Ocean between Madagascar and Australia. That brings us up to speed, so let's dive into the analysis. Similar to the previous flight, the countdown went extremely smoothly. There wasn't even a hold at T-40 seconds. At T-20 seconds, the Firex detonation suppression system activates. At T-7, we can see the flame deflector activating. At T-3, the staggered Raptor ignition sequence starts. Similar to the previous flight, the inner 13 engines start first, followed by 15 of the outer engines and then the final 5. As Starship S28 and B10 lift off, we see that once again all 33 Raptor engines are firing. From this angle we can see a heat shield tile falling off the front right flap, though I couldn't see any others falling. These drone shots of the launches are absolutely stunning. It's crazy how far the shockwaves can be seen. This is our first of many onboard views, unlike in previous flights. This camera is mounted in between the two grid fins on the right side of the booster. The right lift point for the chopsticks is here. We can see lots of chunks of ice falling down, but some of them appear to be heat shield tiles because they seem to be flipping between a light and dark side. We also clearly see Starship rolling so its left side is facing towards the ocean. I believe this is done so it can fly at a slightly higher angle of attack without the giant flaps on the upper stage catching too much air and flipping the vehicle out of control. At T plus 54 seconds, Starship passes 1000 km an hour, which is on par with IFT2. A few seconds after, we hear the Max-Q callout. Once again, this X user charted the vehicle's speed and from this, the acceleration, which I'm very grateful for because it allows us to see so much going on. Here we can see how the engines throttle up shortly after Max-Q. A few seconds later, we see our first view from the camera mounted on Starship's front left flap. This camera is mounted right at the end of the flap. We can see at least four missing or damaged tiles. At one point, a piece of ice or another tile hits the bottom flap and causes some damage to the heat shield. 
Everyday Astronaut and Cosmic Perspective once again have some of the best footage out there, including this beautiful shot that shows us the heat shield. We can see the moment the debris hits the flap. While there are some tiles missing, it doesn't look nearly as bad as the previous flight. Leading up to hot staging, we can see how the vehicle is slowly performing its gravity turn, pitching over, or technically yawing over since it's on its side, but then it stops and even raises back up slightly to make sure it's aligned perfectly prograde to ensure clean staging. Did you catch what else happened in that time? It's easy to miss, but the grid fins rotate before the engines shut down. If you look closely, you can see the grid fin on top turns towards the belly or heat shield side, while the bottom one turns in the opposite direction towards the back. This is very important and we'll explain why and how in a second, but first let's examine the shutdown and ignition process. Exactly on time, the booster's staggered shutdown sequence starts. It's the same as in IFT2, with five engines being shut down at each step until only the center three remain. Exactly four seconds later, the ship's vacuum engines ignite. The vehicles start to separate, and after a 0.8 second delay, the sea level engines also light. If we look at the acceleration chart, it looks very familiar. The acceleration drops rapidly as most of the booster's engines cut off. If we follow the booster's trace, we see it experiences a big spike of negative Gs as the ship's vacuum engines start. Then, the booster's three engines throttle up, but it receives another push backwards as the ship's sea level engines also ignite. After this, the booster's boost back burn starts and it accelerates more. If we overlay the chart from IFT2, it looks practically the same. The only real difference is that the booster doesn't throttle up at Starship Ignition and as a result actually experiences slightly more negative Gs from the ship's exhaust, which is why its trace is slightly lagging behind that of IFT2 from that point on. But if nothing really changed, then why was the booster's boost back burn successful this time? Well, other than the procedural change of slightly delaying the booster's throttle up, the similarity of the plots indicates that the hardware changes are what made the difference. We don't know why the LOX inlet filters were clogged on the previous flight, but thanks to some amazing simulations from Ryan Hansen Space, we can visualize what the slush might have looked like. It's clear the old slush baffles were not able to cope with such an extreme amount of slush. Ryan tested some possible designs for the new baffles with varying results. In the most extreme design, we can see upgraded baffles can make a massive difference. Now back to the grid fins. When the Starship upper stage engines ignite, all their exhaust travels out of the vents in the hot staging ring and expands outwards, impinging on the grid fins. Due to the angle of the fins, they deflect the exhaust in these directions. This results in the fins experiencing forces in these directions. However, we can see that the bottom grid fin stops turning before the top one, which indicates that it's not rotated as far. This will result in the force on the bottom grid fin being weaker. Adding the two force vectors together will give us this resulting force. In addition, since these forces act perpendicular to the lever arm extending to the center of the booster, they induce torques in opposing directions, with the clockwise torque being stronger, resulting in a net torque clockwise. But what about the two grid fins we can't see? Based on the motion of the booster after staging, the other two have to mirror the two that we can see, except the bottom one doesn't stop short. This was partially confirmed by a highlights video SpaceX later released. We can see this grid fin is indeed turned towards the camera. Ignoring torque for now, these two forces are equal and opposite, so they cancel out. That leaves only these two forces. They are opposite, but unequal, so the net force is downwards and to the left. Finally, these two grid fins will induce equal and opposite torques, cancelling each other out, leaving us with just the clockwise torque we already determined. So, in summary, the booster will experience a force downwards, a force to the left, and a clockwise torque. Let's see how that looks. Great, but as we mentioned, the vehicle is actually on its side, and so is the video, so let's turn it the right way up. This makes it clear the booster's motion relative to the world is a simultaneous backflip and a turn to the south with a clockwise roll. Since there is very little air resistance, this initial push is enough to redirect the booster. Also, once the booster has turned away a bit, the ship's exhaust will hit its side, helping it turn even more. But why go through all this trouble instead of just gimbling the booster's engines to turn it away? 
I think that SpaceX wants to avoid doing this because the booster is so empty and its center of mass is so low that the gimbaled engine's thrust line would be close to the center of mass. This means that besides rotating the booster, the thrust would push it in the wrong direction in a kind of power slide, which is not what you want to cleanly separate two vehicles. Now that we fully understand how hot staging and the booster's flip maneuver work, we can discuss the boost back burn. Just like in the previous flight, 5 seconds after separation, as the booster turns away, the inner ring of 10 engines begin to restart in opposing pairs over a 1.3 second period. This time, all of them successfully ignite. The booster onboard view with the ship in the background is incredible. I think the camera's fisheye lens is making it look like the booster is higher than the ship when we know it's actually slightly lower. All 13 engines continue firing for the 48 second long boost back burn until their unusual shutdown sequence, which takes nearly 8 seconds. At first, I thought it could be a glitch in the telemetry, but that's clearly not the case because the booster actually pitches, or yours, up slightly because of the asymmetric thrust. It looks like this is to start the reorientation for an engine's first re-entry, but by the time the shutdown sequence ends, the rotation has stopped. Then it resumes slowly, presumably due to the gas venting we see. The other thing is that the shutdown sequence looks very deliberate. First one engine shuts down, then the one above it, then the one below it, and this alternating above-below pattern continues until only 4 engines on that ring are left. They stay on for a further 3 seconds and then all shut off together. That leaves the final center 3 engines running for another 1.5 seconds before they shut down too. After the boost back burn ends, we see a lot of venting which starts that slow reorientation to prepare for re-entry. Notice how smooth and controlled this is. On the topic of re-entry, it's worth noting that Super Heavy does not re-enter and land exactly like a Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 booster performs an entry burn to slow itself down right at the most intense part of re-entry, then coasts down before doing a final landing burn. The Super Heavy booster skips the entry burn, blasting through those peak stresses and only executing a landing burn at the end. So the booster coasts down engines first. The grid fins start operating at an altitude of exactly 50 kilometers, and we see them immediately working to make a counterclockwise roll correction. But as the grid fin we can see returns to a neutral position, the booster starts rolling clockwise again and the fins have to counter it again. This struggle continues until, at 5 kilometers, the induced rolls become so powerful that the grid fins struggle to keep up, and the booster oscillates back and forth until it appears to hit the water, close to Mark 1. There's no way for us to know why the booster constantly wanted to roll clockwise, but possible reasons could be a problem with the control system or a stuck grid fin. But the roll instability aside, what happened to the landing burn? According to the flight plan, the landing burn was supposed to start at T plus 646. The webcast hosts say that the landing burn will start with all 13 center engines, but we see no sign of that. Interestingly, this is the point at which the roll oscillation started. Perhaps the grid fins were expecting some help from the engines? Only at T plus 654, the engine graphic shows an engine start, followed by another two, which drop out as quickly as they came, before the booster is destroyed. Looking at the plot of the booster's acceleration, we can see the tiniest blip right around when the landing burn was planned. The next time anything happens is when we see the engines attempt to start, but this made little difference. If we rewind to before the landing burn was supposed to start, there are a few points we see some suspiciously shiny metallic debris flying off the booster. At one point, something quite big breaks off the bottom end and flies past. Super Heavy's engines and avionics are well shielded, but it seems that it wasn't enough to deal with the forces of re-entry without an entry burn. Even when some engines do attempt to start, we see green flames in the exhaust, indicating a badly damaged engine is cannibalizing itself. You may have noticed I said the booster appeared to hit the water. It certainly did, but according to SpaceX's post-flight update, it was actually destroyed at an altitude of 462 meters. I initially thought this meant that the flight termination system was activated, but at T plus 622 it sounds like there is a callout announcing the booster's FDS has been saved, or deactivated. That would mean that the booster exploded on its own just over a second before hitting the water. Considering the significant damage to the engines, that wouldn't be surprising. In fact, something similar led to the demise of Starship SN11. Check out that video if you want to know more. 
You might say it looks like the last few frames show the booster falling into the water, but that could just be an illusion created by the supersonic exhaust blasting the water below. With the end of the booster's flight, we can turn our attention to the Starship upper stage. It has a pretty uneventful ascent under all six Raptor engines. If we overlay the acceleration graphs from IFT2 and IFT3 again, they look identical up until this point, where Flight 3 seems to underperform, but that's not what's happening. To simulate the mass of a payload, SpaceX loads some additional liquid oxygen to the ship. This extra LOX needs to be dumped for the ship to re-enter with the correct mass. In IFT2, this dump started at T plus 706, and at the time we thought it was a huge leak. Since this LOX dump contributed to fires which ended up destroying the Starship near the end of the ascent, on IFT3 the dump was performed after orbital insertion. This is why it appears to underperform in this region. In both flights, once the ship reaches an acceleration of 3.5 Gs, the engines throttle down to limit the mechanical strain on the vehicle's structure. It's likely that the sea level engines are throttled down, while the vacuum engines stay at full thrust to take advantage of their greater efficiency. At T plus 820, Starship's vacuum engines shut down, and the three sea level engines continue firing for 15 seconds. We can see how this drops the acceleration to less than half of what it was. This allows for greater precision of orbital insertion on shutdown. It has to be the sea level engines for these last seconds because the vacuum engines can't gimbal for attitude control. When the last three engines shut down, Starship is in an orbit with an apogee of 234 kilometers and a perigee 50 kilometers below the Earth's surface. So, as planned, not a stable orbit. Given how the rest of the flight went, this was a very good idea. This is exactly the same camera on the flap, but the video has been rotated. Throughout most of the rest of the flight, we can see a lot of venting. At least part of this must be the LOX dump, but some of it should be the reaction control system. At T plus 12 minutes, there is a call out saying the payload door is opening. We only get our first internal view over 4 minutes later, and it doesn't look like the door is open at all. The fact that there are gases freely floating around inside also tells us the door is firmly shut. Nearly 2 minutes later, we get another view and now not only do we see light creeping in around the partly open door, but those gases from before get blown out into the vacuum of space. Unfortunately, the door doesn't seem to open more than this. If we jump to 26 minutes later, we can see it in exactly the same position. At T plus 1906, we see that Starship is rolling counterclockwise at a decent rate. Now, this could well be in preparation for the propellant transfer demonstration, which happened a few minutes after this, but we'll come back to this. There's a call out saying the payload door is closing, but I think this is just called out according to the timeline. About two minutes later, we see this. The door seems to come loose and wiggle. Clearly it's not going to close. Over the next 10 minutes, we see the Starship still in that roll, which should have probably ended by now. There's lots of venting and puffs of gas, but the one place that should be puffing gas isn't. At opposite edges of the heat shield, Starship has two thrusters which are used for roll control. We can see one of them over here. This is the one which needs to fire to stop this roll, but at no point in the entire flight do we see that happen. Clearly there is a problem. On the plus side, this means that whenever the video drops out, this little animation is a pretty accurate representation of what the vehicle is doing. The planned Raptor relight did not happen due to vehicle roll rates. Uh, yeah, that's one way to spin it. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Anyway, shortly before re-entry, we see that Starship has picked up a tumble together with its roll. I think what's happened there is that the pitch control is functional and is trying to orientate the ship for entry, but it just can't with the roll being out of control. As the Starship falls through 120 km in altitude, the flaps start operating. A 3D animator has done an amazing job modeling the vehicle's motion during re-entry, and his video is really helpful to understand how the ship is moving. At just over 100 km, we see a glow of plasma on the rear flap. This builds into the most amazing live space footage in history. It's no wonder there were smiles in Mission Control. Starship ends up going side on into the airstream, but thanks to the flaps, it finally manages to stop that roll. However, with the front flaps fully extended and the rear flaps folded in, the nose goes way up and the ship goes vertical. 
The role is finally reversed to move the ship off its side and point the heat shield in the right direction, but the vehicle keeps flipping backwards until it ends up engines first. Definitely not ideal. After this point, it's really difficult to see the orientation, but based on the plasma flow, we can tell the heat shield is facing more or less the right way, until the flow separates from the flap and it looks like the ship is flying side on again. It seems to correct quickly, but when you see these flames at the bottom end, it probably means the ship is flying engines first again. There's no good video after this, but the telemetry continues to sporadically update, which tells us the ship is still alive. The last telemetry update comes at 65 km and a speed of 25724 km per hour. Eventually, the webcast hosts confirm that the ship must have been lost. Interestingly, SpaceX's post-flight update states that the payload door was opened and closed, but we clearly saw that was not the case. They also say the propellant transfer demo was initiated, but there is still no word on whether or not it was successful. The last noteworthy point is that SpaceX is seeking to increase the Starship launch cadence throughout the year, so we might be seeing these flights more often. Now let's discuss what the takeaways from this test flight are, starting with the positives. First, and most important, the ascent was perfect. All 39 Raptor engines on the vehicle performed flawlessly. Both the booster and ship completed their ascent burns without fault. Next, while we still saw some of the heat shield tiles falling off, it was an improvement over previous flights and I think we can expect even more improvement with time as the tile mounting and inspection process is refined. A huge positive for SpaceX is that this flight gave them a lot of data on the control and heating during Starship's hypersonic re-entry. This is invaluable to the long-term goal of making Starship fully reusable. Finally, we just have to mention the amazing onboard views facilitated by Starlink. With a more controlled re-entry, it looks like we could have continuous live video the whole way down. Now for the negatives. It looks like the booster suffered some damage during its re-entry, which is what caused its landing burn to fail. This might require upgrading the engine shielding or changing the return trajectory. I think performing an entry burn might be a last resort. The fact that the payload door failed is disappointing and is probably the main reason that the next flight will not be carrying any Starlink satellites. Finally, the loss of attitude control was another disappointment, since traditional cold gas thrusters are very reliable, but Starship instead uses gas from the main propellant tanks for its attitude control. For all these negatives, I have no doubt that SpaceX is already working on changes. That's just how their iterative design process works. Failure during development is okay when it informs and improves your final design. So what's next for the Starship program? As we mentioned, SpaceX wants to ramp up the launch rate. They're aiming for six more flights this year. Even if they don't quite hit that, we can certainly expect a few more launches this year. There is also an indication that the FAA may move to a multiple launch approval for Starship in the future. SpaceX President Gwyn Shotwell says that SpaceX should be ready for Flight 4 in early May. It was just under 4 months between Flights 2 and 3, so I don't think that's overly optimistic. My guess is we will see the next launch before the end of June. But what do you think? Did I miss anything in my analysis? When do you think Starship will take to the skies again, and how do you think that flight will go? If you enjoyed the video, please click that like button to appease the YouTube algorithm. Sorry I have to ask, but I put so much effort into these videos and your support will make sure people actually get to see them. Please also consider subscribing so you don't miss my future Starship videos. In the meantime, you can check out my previous ones. Thanks for watching. <laughs>